So we are going to start in a minute. Please take your seat. And I would like to warmly welcome you to uh, the second uh, critical dialogue uh, organized uh, in the framework uh, of uh, the Bologna Duke uh, Virginia Summer School. As uh, the previous uh, one, this critical dialogue uh, is jointly organized by the Academy of Global Humanities and Critical Theory and the Fondazione Gramsci Emilia Romagna with the generous uh, support uh, of the Biblioteca dell'Artiginasio, uh, which uh, allows us uh, to gather in such uh, a fascinating uh, and a bit intimidating uh, uh, scenario. As uh, you all know, uh, tonight uh, we have uh, a special guest uh, and I am uh, particularly happy to uh, welcome to Bologna uh, Professor uh, David Harvey. I guess uh, you are uh, all familiar with uh, his uh, work uh, that has been uh, uh, really very important uh, in uh, the development of uh, critical debates uh, over the last uh, four or five decades. David Harvey uh, comes uh, from uh, the UK, he moved to the US at the end of the 60s, and I was very impressed some years ago uh, while uh, reading uh, an interview with uh, David uh, where uh, he was telling about uh, his uh, encounter with uh, urban poverty in uh, Baltimore at uh, the end uh, of the 1960s. And in a way, in that uh, interview, uh, he was uh, kind of uh, foreshadowing the hypothesis according to which his whole work on the urban dimension of capitalist development has been spurred by that particular experience, by that particular encounter. As you all know, the urban dimension uh, has uh, remained uh, at the center of uh, David Harvey's uh, work uh, until uh, now. Among other things, uh, is uh, well known for uh, his uh, work uh, on the notion of the right to the city that has uh, been for him a fundamental key to the understanding of uh, social movements uh, in uh, the present. David Harvey has made uh, a substantial contribution uh, to Marxism. Please allow me just to mention uh, his uh, book uh, of uh, 1982, Limits to Capital, where uh, a very original reading of Capital, Volume 2, allowed him to uh, propose a kind of historical geographic materialism, to mention a label that has remained associated to his work. More recently, David has published uh, a companion to Marx's Capital uh, that has uh, been uh, a real uh, kind of editorial success uh, and that 
has provided a new generation of students and young scholars with a really sophisticated and effective introduction to the reading of Marx. I would just like to mention another of uh, the main books uh, written uh, by David Harvey, uh, that is uh, The Condition of Postmodernity, that came out uh, at the end of the 1980s, in 1989, and I still remember uh, how the translation into Italian of that book uh, was uh, received in uh, this town. It was a kind of fresh air within the whole discussion of postmodernism. In that book, uh, uh, David was uh, introducing uh, the notion of uh, a flexible accumulation regime in order to make sense of uh, the new characteristics uh, of uh, capitalism after the crisis of uh, uh, the 1970s. Mm. David Harvey is uh, well known for uh, many reasons, uh, as you know, and uh, as it is apparent uh, from uh, uh, these uh, scattered uh, references uh, to uh, his uh, work. For uh, our conversation today, the kind of uh, notion that uh, we have singled out uh, is the notion of uh, dispossession. Since uh, the publication of uh, the new imperialism in 2003, David Harvey is also associated to this kind of distinction between uh, accumulation by exploitation and accumulation by dispossession. A distinction that is predicated upon an original reading and reworking of Marx's notion of uh, primitive uh, accumulation. Nowadays, uh, in uh, critical uh, debates surrounding uh, contemporary capitalism, the notion of accumulation by dispossession figures prominent. And uh, the idea behind this conversation is to stage a kind of uh, comparison and encounter between analysis uh, focused on dispossession and analysis focused on extraction. Extraction is another notion that uh, has been circulating a lot in uh, critical uh, theories of capitalism over the last uh, years. So, uh, we will uh, start our dialogue uh, with uh, a statement by David, followed by a statement by myself. We will have a short conversation and then we'll open up the discussion to uh, the floor. But please, uh, uh, first of all, uh, join me in warmly welcoming uh, Professor David Harvey to uh, Bologna. Uh, thank you a lot uh, for that. I been trying to work out when I was last uh, in Bologna and it was uh, somewhere around 1985 something like that I realized it's longer ago than I thought it was um, and at that time uh, I came here partly because I was just being a tourist which is one of the great things about being a geographer is that you can be a tourist and pretend you're working um, but I also came here uh, in search of the Red Bologna. And I'm still in search of the Red Bologna. 
So if anyone can find it for me, uh, please let me know um, and we will go discover it together. Uh, the point about uh, the Red Bologna, which still stays with me, is um, how, do you, how do you organize a whole city politically? How do you organize governance? How do you organize economy? How do you organize daily life? And to me, uh, the, a lot of the writing about the right to the city uh, ran into this problem uh, that uh, we're not talking about individual rights. We're talking about something which is collective, uh, something which is organized, and something which answers what in my own writing I thought was the key question, which is that uh, the issue is not what kind of city uh, we want to create. The issue is what kind of human beings do we want to be. Now, this question of what kinds of human beings we want to be is uh, very much, I think, on the agenda right now. Because uh, we are assaulted with examples of what, in my view, are the kinds of human beings I don't want to be. And I don't want to be associated with. We're seeing a vicious side of humanity, an oppressive side of humanity. We're seeing Donald Trump, and we're seeing Modi, and we're seeing Erdogan, and we're seeing all of this sort of politics. So the issue of what kind of people we want to be, uh, is, it seems to me, in the forefront of discussion. And one of the things that's always been useful to put together is the idea that what kind of people we want to be is not independent of the material world we have constructed. Uh, my prime example here would be, of course, something like uh, suburbanization in the United States. Uh, in the 1930s, in the United States, there was a depression. There were many radical movements. Uh, in World War II, the United States was in alliance with the Soviet Union. Uh, there was a very strong left within the Union movement and amongst intellectuals. And after 1945, uh, there was a crucial kind of question. Uh, for the policymakers in the United States. And that question was, how do you tame the population, wean them away from this idea that socialism, communism might be an alternative? But a clear recognition that you would not be able to do that unless the material conditions changed such that you did not go back into the massive unemployment and the destruction of lives that had gone on in the great crisis of the 1930s. Now, there are many complicated things to be said about what happened, but two elements of it were, first, you organized the repressive apparatus of the state to destroy all elements of left thinking and left ideology. You do it in a rather savage way, a savage way which we in the United States call McCarthyism, where people lost their jobs because they expressed sympathies with the communist cause, where people were taken out of the unions and fired from their positions. Um, a complete assault 
uh, upon left thinking of all kinds, including in the federal government. But the second thing was you had to rejuvenate the economy. And the American economy had increased in productive capacity immensely in the period from 1939 to 45. The war effort assumed, absorbed all the surplus that could be produced and created. A lot of technical innovation occurred during the war. Was there a way to create a kind of world on the basis of that productive capacity? And if so, what would that world look like? Well, there were very many solutions to that. One of them was to have a military arms race with the Soviet Union, so the military apparatus grew immensely after 1945. It did not diminish. And that absorbed a lot of capital, surplus capital, a lot of money was made, a lot of people were employed. The other solution was suburbanization. You subsidized the highway systems, you subsidized uh, people to buy houses, you subsidized the production of urbanization and suburbanization. And the idea behind this was not only to create a new kind of urban environment, but also in a way to create a new kind of personality, a subjective condition of life, which is very much about individual well-being, very much about isolation in the suburbs, keeping to yourself, breaking with many of the traditional elements of solidarity. And if you ask yourself, can you imagine a revolutionary movement emerging from the suburbs as they were then created? Forget it. This was one of the greatest acts of pacification of a population that there's ever been, and it was done through urbanization. So urbanization is not independent of the kind of people that we are. Because it's not that I go to the suburbs thinking a certain way. I go and I find myself involved in a set of daily practices in which I do this, and I do that, and I have to do this, and I have to do that. And my mentality then is focused on daily life, and the daily life of the suburb is not conducive to thinking about a revolutionary transformation of society. So when I think of things in that kind of way, I would think also about, well, how do we create an urban environment which is conducive to a socialist mentality, which is about collectivity, which is about treating the urban as a commons, about treating urban daily life as an absolutely crucial aspect of the reproduction, not only of individuals, but the recreation of social forms of organization, of politics, and the like. So this question of how do we organize a whole city is not divorced at all from the question of what kind of people do we want to be. And I think something that's very interesting right now is that in the United States, one of the responses to Trump's election has been a growing awareness in many urban areas that, the, uh, that, that city governments, that city institutions can be constructed as a barrier to that kind of personality. That the cities have something to say which is different from society as a whole. We have not exactly left-wing, but radical thinking uh, mayors, we have radical thinking city councils who are interested in creating sanctuary cities for immigrants, who are interested in trying to create a different kind of urban environment as an antidote to Trump. And I think one of the most interesting things we saw was when Trump withdrew from the Paris Accords on Climate Change 
hundreds of cities across the United States declared that they were going to stick with the Paris Accords and try to work with the Paris Accords no matter what Trump said. And of course in Europe, in Spain, we see radical mayors who are trying to do something very different too. So the question of how we organize a whole city and the question of what kind of people we want to be, when they go together in this way, have to then, I think, make a major contribution politically to where society might go. In so doing, huge battles have to be fought because cities are increasingly becoming places for individuals, capitalists, institutions, and even governments to invest in, not cities for people to live in. And there's a key difference here. We see it just recently in that awful event in London, that a low-income population isolated in a very high-income area. One of the ways in which you get hold of that land is to allow sites of that sort which house low-income populations to deteriorate, neglect them. Use, it, use the dogma of austerity to say, we cannot provide the services. And then what happens is that those places get taken over by the big investors and there are all these empty apartments in London which people have just invested in. In New York, we have a huge building boom, upper income, condominiums, huge amount of it. And yet there's a crisis of affordable housing. Half of the New York City population tries to live on less than $30,000 a year. Try to find a place to live on $30,000 a year. Cities have become sites for investment, speculation. Cities have become places where things do get built, but not to cure the affordable housing problem, but to simply provide a super kind of living space for some Arab sheikh or some Russian oligarch or some you know, rich person from somewhere to just buy a place as a good investment. When the, when the Chinese relaxed their controls on individuals taking money out of the country, within six months a vast flood of money arrived all around the world to buy apartments everywhere. Melbourne, Vancouver, New York, London. Not, again, places to live, but places to invest in, to store savings in, to keep wealth circulating within the family. So a battle has to be fought with the powers of finance capital and what finance and everything is about. And that is where we get round to the fact that some of the elements that Marx talked about in his theory of primitive accumulation, and at one point he said credit is one of the big ways of primitive accumulation. There's a continuity between some of the techniques of primitive accumulation and what I call accumulation by dispossession. Credit is one of the big ones. Because that is at the center of a great deal of dispossession which is going on in the world right now. That coupled with what Sandra mentioned about uh, extractivism. But maybe we can talk further about that. Yes, I think the last point made uh, by David uh, uh, is particularly important. Mm. If uh, we think of uh, the cities we inhabit, of the urban spaces we traverse every day, 
we immediately grasp the multiple ways in which uh, financial devices, financial powers are uh, producing the city through processes of continuous disruption of uh, the social uh, urban fabric. We cannot think of uh, the city nowadays without uh, taking into account uh, this uh, take of uh, finance uh, on uh, the very development of uh, urban spaces. And finance disseminates within the urban space what I would like to define as extractive devices. Which means that finance frames the urban space as a space for the continuous extraction of value in the form of rent. If you think of other important economic capitalist actors that play a crucial role in shaping urban environment, if you think, for instance, uh, of uh, what is called today uh, platform capital, you are once again kind of confronted with uh, extractive devices. By platform capitalism, I refer to uh, such uh, platforms as, uh, for instance, Uber, Fudora, Airbnb, and the like, that are really transforming in a radical way our experience of urban spaces. They are transforming our experience of urban spaces, not necessarily in a negative way, but nonetheless, the way in which these platforms work is, again, an extractive way. Which means that these platforms extract value from processes of social cooperation that are deployed within urban space. So I think what is uh, particularly important uh, to reflect upon uh, is precisely uh, the kind of continuous encounter and clash between uh, what uh, I have very quickly defined as uh, extractive devices and processes of social cooperation, social practices, social activities that also play a very important role in shaping urban spaces. Is there something like a new definition of exploitation at stake in this encounter, in these multiple clashes. I think this is the case. I think that nowadays, thinking of such important operations of capital as the one connected with finance, logistics, digitalization, we can flesh out the idea 
of a kind of direct uh, confrontation between extractive devices on the one hand and processes of social cooperation that are the source of value that is extracted by finance, by logistics, by platforms. I think that in this encounter, in these multiple clashes, we can begin to discern a new contour of exploitation that is significantly different from the traditional image of exploitation forged upon the experience of factory work. Let me just add that when I talk of a kind of direct confrontation between social cooperation and extractive devices operations of capital, I don't imagine social cooperation to be a kind of already constituted social and potentially political subject. I am very much aware of the fact that social cooperation is crisscrossed by multiple lines of division by multiple hierarchies, by divisions and hierarchies that work and continually refrain gender, race, class. Nevertheless, I am convinced that only working toward a politicization of uh, social cooperation, we can uh, imagine to build the ground for an effective kind of confrontation of uh, the extractive operations of contemporary capital that, among other things, produce in urban spaces, the effects that David was mentioning and that David has been analyzing in such an effective way in his writings in the last years and decades. So maybe a question to continue the conversation is precisely how you imagine the social composition and the political nature of a movement or of a coalition of movements capable to lay the ground for a socialist imagination of the city as a whole. Of course, you started with the most difficult question <laughs> of the lot. <laughs> um, I think, uh, uh, let, me, let me start with um, an, an example. Uh, in the crisis of 2007-2008, nearly uh, 7 million people in the United States lost their homes. Now, the ideology uh, is such in the United States that uh, home ownership is probably one of the most precious possessions. That's one of the most precious parts of the, quote, American dream and seven million people are suddenly extracted from it, taken out of it. 
One of the things that struck me at the time, which was very strange, first was a simple policy question. Why did the state not prevent that? Uh, if the state had said, okay, there's a problem, we will cover it. We have enough money to cover it. If they had done that, there would have been no, no financial crisis because all of the mortgages would have been viable and the world would be a very different place and people would still be living in their homes. That was the first thing that struck me as very strange that this option was never seriously discussed. Uh, the second option was to let everybody lose their homes let the homes go into foreclosure, uh, the mortgages are worthless, the banks and other financial institutions may go bankrupt. So the state, instead of supporting the people, supports the banks and saves the banks. In that situation, I would have thought the people who had been foreclosed upon uh, would have uh, formed the leading edge of a political movement around, simply around that, how that option was chosen and what its consequences were. So, uh, few actions, but by and large, nothing. And the initial uh, conclusions that came from social researchers asking about what people thought was that uh, the people who'd been foreclosed upon blamed themselves, not the system. Now it turned out that, in fact, there was a good deal of reason, in, at least in many cases, for them to blame themselves because uh, many people were speculating and got caught. But the fact that nearly everybody blamed themselves suggests a deep implantation of a certain neoliberal ethic, a neoliberal ideology that has accepted by 2007 and 2008 a doctrine of personal responsibility which said that you are in charge of your own education you are in charge of your own health care you're in charge of your own housing it's your personal responsibility and if anything goes wrong it's your fault So one of the first things that it seemed important for me to do was to try to say, well, yeah, some of you did indeed play the system and try to make money off it. You got caught. But on the other hand, this is a terrible, terrible system, which actually creates the sort of situation uh, which was going on in housing markets uh, 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 during the early first part of this century. Now, if you know, people have you know, subjectively taken on this kind of positioning in terms of defining who they are in relationship to the system, what they can expect, from the state apparatus and what they can expect uh, in, in terms of their own well-being. And again, there is, uh, at least in, in the United States, uh, kind of a, a very strong kind of ideology of personal um, liberation and the like. So you're facing, you're facing uh, what I would call a set of mental conceptions of the world which are not conducive to the construction of 
the sorts of social solidarities that can be built around what would be needed to create an alternative kind of city. But there is something else here which becomes, I think, overwhelming, which is that the power structure behind a lot of what has been happening. First off, a lot of it is hidden. I mean, Marx often wrote about the fetishism, the disguises, which capital assumes, and it's very well, I think, disguised many of the basic and powerful institutions. The nature of those institutions only becomes apparent in the midst of a crisis. And if you want, for you, I'm sure you'll understand when I say that Greece showed what that institutional framework was. It was not democracy, it was, had nothing to do with governance, had nothing to do with anything except that it is the European Union, the central bank and the IMF. That is what I would call the state finance nexus, which controls the power, which can force upon a whole country in this case, an, an austerity regime, an extractivism of wealth, and do it in a way that has no respect whatsoever for democratic institutions creates what I think many of us are living today but without probably realizing a, a situation of debt peonage. Debt peonage which is a sort of form of slavery to your debts. A debt is a claim on future labor. In the United States we have a student population that owes something like 1.1 trillion dollars. Their future labor is foreclosed upon. It is already there. They live under conditions of debt peonage. The growth of student debt worldwide has become a real big problem. But see how it actually is also a measure of social control. If you're deeply indebted, you obviously have to spend a lot of your energy and your time redeeming the debt. You can't do anything until you have redeemed the debt. Now when you mention this, people give up and they say, what can we do about the European Central Bank? about the European Stabilization Fund with the IMF. What, what power do we have against that? And that's a difficult question to, to answer. Because that's where the real power lies. You can capture a part of a city and do something with it, which is, and I'm all in favor of this, you know and do something different in it and, and, and struggle to do something different in it. You can get a radical mayor in Barcelona who tries to do something you know, very different in terms of governance structures and democracy and decision making. But there are limits to that. And the limits lie in the fact that right now the main financial institutions in the world largely hidden, we're unaware of how powerful and how significant they are. And this became obvious in the United States during that foreclosure crisis of 2007 and 2008. Uh, the president disappeared, we didn't know where he was. Or Congress disappeared, they didn't know where to go. Two people came on television and said, this is what we're going to do. One was the chair of the Federal Reserve Bank, Ben Bernanke, and the other was the Secretary of the Treasury. 
And together they wrote a three-page document which said, this is what we do. Congress got upset that they came so decisively with a three-page document, so Congress went into session and turned it into a 300-page document, but essentially saying the same thing. Bail out the banks, troubled asset relief, corporation, give money to the banks, and even if they didn't want it, give it to the banks and tell them to try and solve the problem. The banks did not, of course, they just took the money and said, thanks very much, we'll retire some of our own debts for this money and then forget it, which is why the recovery has been so slow. But this is the other point, that at some point or other we need to have to create not simply a social organization that dominate a neighborhood, transform its lifestyle, its sociality, its way of being, the, the, the prices of its property, uh, the, the forms of, of tenure and things of that kind, which, which can be done and is being done in certain places. But not only that, at some point or other we have to reach for saying, why do we have this incredible concentration of political and economic power in a very few institutions controlled effectively by a banking oligarchy which has only one interest. And that one interest is of course to increase its own wealth and power. Why do we have that situation? And what can be done about it politically? Part of my argument here would be to say, first off, we have to be aware that situation exists. Secondly, we have to be aware that the kind of organization that can confront that kind of organization is not necessarily the optimal form of democratic organization that we currently advocate when we're looking at more local conditions, more local configurations of sociality and power. And that therefore we need a two-pronged approach. One based on increasing democracy, increasing solidarities, increasing socialities, which can be the basis of a much more widespread movement, which is going to ask the question, who controls the central banks. I mean, Marx once took the slogan that was really due to Auguste Blanqui about the dictatorship of the proletariat. In effect, we now live under the dictatorship of the world's central banks. And that dictatorship is empowered and informed by a structure of debt peonage in which many of us have a future that's already foreclosed, either in terms of a national debt or a local debt or a personal debt. And the levels of indebtedness now have increased astronomically over the last 30, 40 years. The, there's a very important ratio that people talk about, which is debt to GDP. When the debt is 100% of GDP, the tendency is to say, this is getting to be a bit of a problem. Global debt right now stands at 225% of global GDP. In other words, the indebtedness level at the global level is now of the sort that in the 1980s would have led the International Monetary Fund to intervene and to impose incredible levels of austerity on countries like Mexico and elsewhere. And this situation that we are now in seems to me to be a critical situation because who is going to discipline the IMF? Who is going to discipline the state finance nexus? Who is going to control it? And who is going to deal with 
the huge volume of indebtedness in which the world now exists. So sorry I didn't really answer your question. But as you see, it's partly, yes, there are things to be done and there are a lot of things being done at many local levels. I encounter them all over the place. They are inspiring, they're great, uh, they're wonderful. But, but there's another mission which has to be undertaken. You didn't uh, really ask uh, my question, but uh, you raised a whole set uh, of uh, very important and very difficult uh, uh, questions. Let me uh, briefly comment upon a couple of points uh, you made. First point has to do with uh, the huge limits that are placed upon uh, cities but also states by the way in which uh, capitalism works nowadays. In the age of uh, industrial capital, in the age of Fordism, to use uh, this short and uh, notion, capital of course raised limits upon states, but they were different <laughs> limits. They were negotiable in a kind of dialectical way. The limits that contemporary capitalism places upon states and politics are of a different nature. It is much more difficult to negotiate those limits. And this is the reason why classical reformist projects have become so difficult to implement nowadays. In a way, as the Greek experience demonstrates, we could even say that in order to make the implementation of a reformist agenda possible, what is needed uh, is a revolutionary break uh, with uh, the limits uh, that uh, David has so eloquently described. And I think uh, this is a kind of uh, important point to reflect upon. Mm? We are still caught uh, within uh, you know, the alternative reform uh, versus revolution in the left, but maybe this uh, alternative uh, is not uh, particularly valuable, particularly uh, important nowadays. And precisely because uh, uh, the form of uh, capitalist uh, development we are confronted with uh, has uh, displaced uh, and disrupted uh, the very conditions of uh, traditional uh, reforms. As far as I am concerned, with many other scholars, thinkers, activists, uh, I am convinced that these limits, uh, the quality of uh, these limits, uh, are uh, connected uh, with uh, the uh, new position uh, of finance within uh, the uh, wider uh, working of uh, capitalism. And uh, I think that uh, it is uh, worth uh, looking uh, at finance through the lenses of extraction. When uh, we hear the word extraction, we think of uh, mines. Mm? We think of uh, extensive uh, agriculture. But I think that there is much to gain from an expanded notion of uh, extraction uh, that allows us uh, to 
analyze, for instance, the operation of finance with respect to, let's say, social life, social cooperation. David was talking about debt. But what is debt in the kind of proportions that we are witnessing nowadays? That is an extractive device, meaning that the spread of that indebtedness across the social fabric produces a foreclosure of the future. The indebted subject is a subject that is compelled to work for his or her all life. This subject works and finance extracts value from the subject's work. So I think that we have to be aware of the kind of predicament we are currently living True. I have talked about uh, the limits placed uh, by contemporary capital upon states and uh, polities, which means uh, about limits uh, posited from above. But if we look uh, at uh, that in that moment, uh, we can see very well uh, that. Uh, we are confronted also with a dissemination of devices of subjectivation that work from below. So how can we imagine a political project, a political kind of action and practice capable of confronting at the same time the limits from above and uh, the operations of these devices of subjectivation from uh, below. I agree with David that uh, we have, uh, in a way, uh, to think uh, uh, at least uh, through uh, a double movement. We have to imagine and to foster the uh, creation of uh, uh, social power from uh, below, capable to confront uh, the uh, daily operations of capital within uh, the social fabric. David was talking about uh, uh, the seven million people who lost uh, their home uh, in the wake of uh, the financial crisis 2007-2008, and he was talking about uh, you know, the difficulty uh, to uh, promote social struggles uh, protagonized by these people. If we look to Spain, uh, we are confronted with a quite similar situation in which, nevertheless, there were and there are very interesting and effective experiences of struggle of the people affected by mortgages, as they say in Spain, that were able to overcome the shape generated by the sheer fact to have lost the home. Talking with the activists of the platform of people affected by mortgages in Spain, what always struck me is this reference to shape. To, uh, you know, even the psychological difficulty of uh, uh, getting rid of this kind of, let's say, neoliberal shape and uh, to find uh, a new possibility to struggle 
and to live uh, within uh, uh, the common, within uh, uh, a social movement uh, capable to uh, stabilize itself. I think this is a very important point, capable to stabilize itself in its uh, autonomy. What we need from this point of view is really the stabilization of uh, a multiplicity of uh, societal counterparts that are not to be absorbed and annihilated by an electoral victory, for instance. But the problem remains how to confront the limits posited from above. And I think this is a question upon which uh, we have uh, to continue to discuss, uh, to experiment, uh, and uh, to uh, imagine uh, possible uh, kind of uh, ruptures and breaks. I do not think that uh, uh, it is possible to uh, imagine uh, kind of a radical break uh, that uh, from one day to the other uh, produces uh, in a single country, in a single region of the world, uh, the conditions for uh, the implementation of agendas of emancipation, emancipation and liberation. I think uh, we have uh, to imagine a multiplicity of ruptures and a concatenation of ruptures and uh, uh, breaks uh, within, uh, and this is my last point, an important point for me, a transnational dimension. Within a transnational dimension, because the limits placed upon the state and the polities by contemporary capital are not national limits. Are not national limits. And so what we need is to confront them within the transnational space in which they operate. Yeah, there are, there are things happening at that level which I think are interesting. Um, for, for example, um, I, I have a pension fund which is, uh, as most, this happens to most people in the United States, it's a privately organized pension fund, it's an investment fund. Uh, and it has a, an obligation uh, to find the highest rate of return on my capital. And uh, it turns out that uh, one of the things they've been involved in is uh, land grabbing in Latin America. Uh, Harvard Endowment uh, has been investing in land deals in Africa. Um, and at this point, you, you suddenly, I, I, I get into this thing where, you know, the stock market starts to collapse and I, I cheer and I say, yeah, end of capitalism's coming. And then I look at my pension fund and say, oh my God, all my, all my future has disappeared, which happened in 2007, 2008. It's taken a long time to get it back. But there's something very interesting about the way pension funds got organized. And we, we treat this as natural and of course more and more been attempts in the United States, for example, to shift social security from a state system to an investment system. And it always says you'll be better off in the investment system than in the state system and so on. But then you get very peculiar relationships set up. For example, there's a pension fund of state employees in California, which has been having some financial difficulties. So it was very anxious to get some high-yielding investments. 
And one of the big uh, hedge funds came along and said uh, they would like to buy out this very large complex in which about 150,000 people live, a big housing complex in Oakland. Would the pension fund lend the money to the hedge fund to, to do the buyout? And they would guarantee to the hedge fund a good rate of return, I don't know, 8-10% or whatever. So the hedge fund, so they guarantee to the pension fund. So the pension fund funded this takeover of this very large housing complex. And of course what the hedge fund did was to start to take uh, the low income rents in the place and expel the people uh, by various means, uh, some legal, some illegal, so that they could turn and convert those apartments into high rent. And this was the way in which the pension, which the hedge fund was going to recuperate enough money to pay the pension fund. And the last count, uh, I had a student working on this, something like uh, 2,000 families have been forced out of the complex. And it turned out that at least 100 of them were actually pensioners of the, of the pension fund. So in a sense, they were guaranteeing their pension fund by accepting that they'd be thrown out of their housing. Now this is the kind of insane economics that arises out of this in, in, and actually, you can take that micro example and set it up to look at what's happened to whole countries, and, and, it, and it's insane. But at the same time, the pension fund is doing okay, the hedge fund is doing gloriously, as they always do, and come out of this with a fantastic amount of profit in, in the end. So, and this can go international and is going international, as I mentioned. My own pension fund, uh, so there was a protest uh, within the members of the pension fund who said we don't approve at all of you know, this kind of pension, you know, this kind of thing. But then you get back to the, what's the logic of pension funds. The logic of pension funds is that you save for your future. If there was a different way to assure people of their future, so we abolished all private pension funds. And everybody was then guaranteed an income at age 65 or something of that kind. This, this would be a very different world. But we've accepted as natural in many parts of the world that this is how pension funds should work and this is good. So nobody's done a real critique of this. And this is a way of also saying to me, uh, my pension fund in effect says to me, that in order to assure my future, I have to agree to the kinds of strategies of investment which population is using, but, but then, then I don't agree, and then that puts me in this kind of moral dilemma that I'm, I'm personally not able to get out of. Uh, but collectively, there has to be some way of, 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 of doing something about this. But collectively, it's difficult because, as you say, uh, yeah, when Bill Clinton came to power as president in 1992, whenever it was, he laid out all these plans, what he was going to do, you know, all a very progressive thing, and uh, his chief economic advisor, Robert Rubin, from Goldman Sachs, said, you can't do it. He said, why not? He said, because Wall Street won't let you. And the famous line from Bill Clinton was, you mean to say, my whole economic program depends on the opinions of a bunch of fucking, fucking bond traders? And the answer was yes. And ever since then, the Treasury of the United States has essentially been run by somebody from Goldman Sachs. So this is what we're talking about, this interpenetration of state and, and financial power. Well, I would like very much to reply and to continue 
the dialogue, uh, but uh, I think it is more important uh, to open uh, uh, the conversation uh, to uh, the audience. Uh, we have time for three, four uh, questions, comments. Mm -hmm. Is there a mic? Uh, in, uh, otherwise I can. Uh, well, I was wondering if maybe some of you could talk a little bit more about in relation to the ways in which we have to struggle in these two regimes, in these two different scales, right? Capital operates at once at the level of the, the global, right? It's always global and globalizing capital. Uh, to some, that means that the nation state becomes uh, a unit uh, from which then to struggle, right? I wonder, uh, first question is, uh, to what extent, what is the role of the nation state or the state in particular today? Uh, for some, as we heard earlier uh, this week in, in a lecture, even though the nation state is, uh, is obviously weakened by flows of global capital, it is, stay, it is still a terrain of struggle, right? Uh, this is Garcia Linera's argument in Bolivia and, and many others. Uh, so that's one question. And related to that, at the discursive level, uh, to what extent do you all think that, uh, Professor Harvey, um, that the emphasis on accumulation rather than uh, extraction uh, discursively maybe hides the ways, uh, I mean, there's a difference between where uh, we place the problem, if it's a, it's a, it's a question of accumulation uh, or if it's a question of extraction. So it seems to me like extraction emphasizes uh, the ways in which uh, the current processes of, of, capital, of, of, capital, uh, of capitalism actually uh, uh, centered on uh, where values produced, and accumulation maybe mystifies the, that relation. So I wanted to, to hear more also, uh, Professor Harvey, uh, what, what do you make of, of the shift towards thinking about accumulation by dispossession as extraction or through extraction? First, a question for Sandro um, about uh, extraction as a way of uh, taking value from a social process, and you mentioned platforms um, like Uber and Airbnb. Um, but it seems to me that that assumes that there was a social form of cooperation before Uber or before Airbnb came along. That. Uh, maybe people were already giving each other rides for free or something or based on some kind of um, other form. Um, and then a uh, question um, for David. Um, the, um, the limits that um, central banks or that debt puts um, relies on, a, it seems, a, a, a double subjectivity. First, that people want to um, honor their debts. So, um, but, you know, one way to struggle against that is debt strikes, which have happened, or debt forgiveness. And the, the other um, um, subjectivity that it relies on is trust in the, that single currency. And, um, you know, one way of struggle against that is multiple currencies and overlapping currencies that can be controlled at multiple levels of social organization that are not at the central bank. Um, so, the central bank only has control when you think that only the central bank can create money, whereas any two people can create a currency. Um, well, I have two questions. One uh, is about that, and one is about the uh, response to social movements and um, revolutionary movements. And the first question is, um, it's not questions, um, I, I, I'd like uh, Professor Harvey to um, um, talk about the, um, the stance that David Graeber um, used uh, about that, and the fact that he um, favors the possibility to um, uh, erase that as a, um, a, a demand that social movements can, can, can use to start uh, revolutionary movements. 
And the second question is about the uh, response, uh, about um, the uh, revolutionary demands that social movements can make. I'm referring to, uh, in particular, the, um, the response, for example, that uh, has um, been um, given to, to uh, the, the Greek government, for example, in uh, last years. And uh, more importantly, to those third world countries like um, uh, that experienced the so-called Arab uh, Spring and um, the, the revolutionary movements that happened there, and uh, how to counteract those uh, to those responses of sometimes very brutal responses, such as in uh, Egypt and the like. Thank you. The last one. Yes. Ah, thank you. I have a question regarding the ecological economics concept, energy return on energy invested, which, as I'm sure you know, it looks at the amount of energy that is spent to mine more energy, like one barrel of oil you spend digging out to get X many barrels back. And this has dropped very sharply over the last hundred years. It went from something like a thousand barrels of oil for every one that you invested in it, and by the 1970s it was down to about a hundred barrels of oil for one getting one energy uh, unit taking it out, and these days it's down to about 12, 12 barrels of oil, and for tar sands I think it's about 3 to 1 ratio, which means it's almost not fuel. It's so inefficient. So we're in this uh, incredible contradiction where on one hand capitalism has never been more productive, produced more things, yet it's never been so inefficient. And I was interested to get your opinions on the limit to growth thesis and what relevance that has in the critique and struggle against capitalism today. Um, working backwards, uh, the limits um, are, are these days uh, all over the place. Um, I think uh, I voice it in a rather different way. Uh, capital has always had to grow and grow at a compound rate. Uh, the compounding rate of growth produces an exponential curve which uh, sort of zooms up after a while. Um, and uh, I think since around 1970 we've been on the zooming track of the exponential curve. And I think it's characterized by the fact that exponential growth in 1850, when capital was dominant in only a very small part of the world, is a different story from exponential growth from now on, where the whole world is effectively covered with capitalist forms of development. And you think about the exponential growth of what's been happening in China and so on and everywhere else and it becomes pretty terrifying but it's terrifying in a, a, a variety of ways uh, not simply uh, on the ecological dimension which is clearly significant and very important and therefore what I would consider one of the serious contradictions of capital in the present era compared to say uh, 150 years ago uh, but in many other aspects, social, political, and so on, uh, it, it also has become a problem. It's become a problem physically, and to some degree, there's only one form of capital that can grow exponentially without limit, and that's money. Commodity form cannot do it, and production cannot do it. So we've seen a divorce in effect, between value production in production and productive activity to the circuit of money capital, which is now hegemonic and which is dominant and has its own forms of extracting value, which I think is what Sandro is, is talking about and what I'm uh, talking about too, that the extraction of value through monetary operations has become absolutely critical. 
the Chinese have an interesting take on this, by the way. In their literature, they take the view that the United States now, uh, about a third of its GDP is taken up with actually producing anything. Two thirds of its GDP is due to financial manipulations and extractions from the rest of the world. Uh, China, of course, is different. It produces you know, very little in the way of financial extractions and is producing a lot through uh, value production in, 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 in actual production. So this uh, is a, a, a move, it seems to me, in, in, in what's happening to global capitalism. And it's no accident that this move towards finance and extractivism has been accompanied by a politics of austerity and the repositioning of what the state is about. I've never taken the view that the state was disempowered. A lot of powers now reside within the state and in many respects the state is stronger than it's ever been. But it's mainly become stronger by becoming militarized uh, and particularly becoming militarized in its means of social control. You only have to look at what, you know, the ways in which relatively minor actions get turned into major events uh, by immediate police repression. The astonishing police repression of the Occupy movement in New York, uh, for example, uh, is what I'm, what I'm talking about. So the state has become more and more significant. And, you know, in New York it was simply a matter of uh, Wall Street people getting nervous about all of this stuff because the Wall Street people knew perfectly well that most of them belonged in jail. Uh, they didn't want to go there and they thought if the Occupy movement got any strength uh, this would be terrible for them. So they called Bloomberg, who's one of them, and said, squash this movement. And of course, squash it they did. So the militarization of state power is, it seems to me, something that's uh, very uh, significant and, and the state is still uh, has a residual power. Right now it is dominated by finance and, and by elections are dominated by money, uh, all of those kinds of things. Some of that can be changed and there are reform movements around about that. But there are things to be done. I mean, I just mentioned a couple of them. Abolish all pension funds, for example, might be a good place to start and turn it into a guaranteed income for life uh, for all elements in the population on a much more egalitarian basis. Turn, uh, um, you know, turn some of the forms of sociality which have which become the basis of extractivism uh, back into something which is much more about the sociality and less and less about the extractivism. And there is a problem here, there is no such thing as a good idea from the left that the capital is not able to turn into a form of exploitation. And we've seen that in you know, Airbnb and things of that kind. We see it in worker cooperatives as well. We see it in some co-op housing. Uh, and, and the like. So we always have to be aware of that, but battles have to be fought along all of those fronts. And I think that to the degree that they are being fought out, increasingly in the cities, so I think that city politics now is actually a, a very important place uh, to put one's energy into, because it's there that it forms a social organization simply out of uh, the necessity of creating a, a, a a better form of life and we've seen uh, urban uprisings uh, like Gezi Park, like what happened in Brazil uh, in, in 2013, which are, are really uprisings against the deficiencies of daily life which capital is imposing upon the cities. And so I think there is the basis for some sort of movement there. It's going to take uh, a lot of work and a lot of serious thought on the part of the left in terms of, you know, what kinds of strategies are to construct around it. So we are uh, running out of time, so uh, allow me to be very short, uh, just a couple of words uh, uh, on two points. Uh, 
that uh, have been uh, uh, raised. Uh, the question of the nation state. <laughs> I think that David was already saying something important about uh, that question. Uh, what uh, uh, I would like to add uh, is that uh, we do not uh, need to be uh, state phobic. I do not at all exclude the possibility that uh, existing states can play a role within uh, projects of uh, emancipation and uh, liberation. What I exclude is that uh, states can be at the center of these projects. What we have to get rid of is uh, the idea of a state-centered politics of emancipation, to uh, mention a phrase introduced uh, by Raquel Gutierrez Aguilar. And we have to get rid of this notion of uh, state-centered politics, uh, at least for two reasons that are equally important. The first one, the first one, is a kind of uh, historical reason. I mean, we are celebrating, and we need to celebrate the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. We need to celebrate the uh, genius of uh, the Bolsheviks, but at the same time, we have uh, to. Uh, kind of uh, make a balance sheet of uh, that experience. Of an experience that started from the idea of the abolition of the state and ended up building a monstrous state apparatus. If we look at uh, social democratic politics in the 20th century, well, in different forms, also social democratic politics was completely centered upon the state. Was completely centered upon an idea of social transformation, economic reforms through the state. Well, both experiences, in a way, fail. Both experiences have something to offer to us, but we do not have to forget their failure. And their failure is associated with this notion of a state-centered politics, of a politics centered upon the state. The second reason why we have to get rid of this idea of a state-centered politics of social transformation has to do with political realism. We have to acknowledge that the state nowadays, to put it very shortly, is not powerful enough to confront capital. So something else, another source of power other sources of power are needed if we want to confront in an effective way capital. Within this, uh, let's say, configuration of powers, the state can definitely play an important role, but not the absolute protagonist, so to say, of social transformation. Second question regards platform capitalism uh, and sharing economy. Platform capitalism is not sharing economy. Platform capitalism refers to the occupation of the spaces of sharing economy by powerful capitalist platforms as the ones that have been mentioned, Airbnb, Fudora, Uber. So here again, as David was saying, there is a tension, there is a potential conflict between the kind of sociality that 
is uh, at stake in uh, practices of uh, sharing and their uh, appropriation and uh, valorization through uh, capitalist platforms that work according, you know, the logical profit, that exploit surplus labor. For instance, in the case of Uber, I will just conclude with a couple of words on Uber. I have always been fascinated by taxis since uh, I saw taxi drivers, and so I mean, I follow <laughs> this word <laughs> in a very careful way. Maybe some of you uh, will remember the book uh, by Biju Matthew mm -hmm. that came out uh, 10 years ago, uh, Taxi. Mm -hmm. It was a very powerful analysis of the development of the taxi industry in New York and of uh, the uh, extraordinary social struggles that uh, punctuated the evolution of the taxi uh, industry in New York. So just think of a, a company as the ones analyzed by Biju Matthew. That company had 10, 20, 50, 200 drivers. If you want to make sense of uh, the valorization of capital in the case of uh, such companies, in a way you can uh, uh, refer to uh, uh, the labor value, uh, theory of value uh, elaborated by Marx in its uh, uh, easiest uh, value. Those companies uh, exploit the labor and uh, the surplus labor of individual drivers. That could be said. Now think of Uber. Also, Uber exploits uh, the labor, the surplus labor of individual drivers. But what makes the peculiarity of Uber is precisely the fact that there is uh, another factor that makes uh, the work of the platform possible. And this factor has to do with society writ large, with the fact that in society, within a metropolitan space, there are thousands of people who are available to become drivers for Uber. So this is a kind of element that is not reducible to the labor and the labor time of an individual driver. So from this very easy example, you can see once again how social cooperation plays a very important role in the working of such extractive platforms as Uber. So unfortunately, it's quite late. We have to close this conversation. Just let me remind that tomorrow at 6 p.m. there will be an installation and parade connected to a very important lab that took place within the summer school. And the meeting point is the archaeological civic museum. And then we'll uh, gather again here, but in the uh, Stabat Mater room on Friday at 7.30 p.m. to continue the discussion with uh, David Harvey and uh, to listen to uh, his lecture. Uh, the title of the lecture is Sovereignty, Movements and the Rights to the City. Mm. So thank you very much and I hope to see you tomorrow and